Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors. Also, welcome to those of you joining us via live stream. Uh, welcome to Southern Hills. I hope everyone had a chance to pick up a bulletin on the way in. If not, there's still plenty of copies left in the back foyer, um, or you can look at it online. So I encourage you to take a minute and look at the, uh, the bulletin, either the hard copy or look at it online. But just a few announcements we'd like to, put, uh, like, to, like to make before we begin our services. Lois Pratt had a bad reaction to her second COVID shot. Uh, spent some time recently in Williamson Medical Center, but she is back at uh, Morning Point in Spring Hill. So I know she'd like to be remembered in our prayers as she's working through some of those uh, reactions she had. Also, Doug Smithson spent some time in St. Thomas West for some breathing issues uh, due to pneumonia. So I know he would like to be remembered in our prayers as he's recovering from that time over at St. Thomas. We do want to extend our sympathy to Tyler and McKenna Adkins on the sudden passing of Tyler's grandfather. Uh, no arrangements have been made at this time, but I know they'd like to be remembered in our prayers as they travel to and from Michigan. Also, we'd like to continue to extend our sympathy to Bobby and Wanda Ezel and the passing of their son-in-law, Michael Rains. And due to the weather issues that we've had recently, uh, the funeral service has been moved to Wednesday the 24th in Memphis. Uh, we also want to congratulate Chuck, Chuck and Jennifer Meek on the, the birth of their youngest son, Colton Branch Meek. He was born February the 16th, uh, weighing seven pounds, three ounces, and he was 19 and a half inches long. Uh, everyone is doing great and they are at home, so uh, look forward to meeting Colton Branch as soon as he's able to make it to uh, one of our services. Today we, we will have be, be having Lives of Leaders practice at 2.30 in the Fellowship Hall. I encourage everyone who's involved in the Lives of Leaders program uh, to be here. Also it was pointed out to me that Breakfast with Dan is in the bulletin as March the 5th. Um, it's actually March, March the 12th. It's a second Friday of every month. So make that change and I encourage everyone to be here for breakfast with Dan. Also, let us know if you're planning to be here just so we can make sure we have enough food for, for everyone that day. But those are the announcements that I have for this morning. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day that you have blessed us with. We're thankful for the technology that we can join uh, via live stream and over the internet when we are unable to be here in person. Father, we pray that you be with each one of us as we enter into this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Our first song will be number 836. Number 836, we'll sing all three verses.
before our opening prayer and scripture reading, we'll sing number 368. Number 368. Again, we'll sing all three verses. I hear the Savior say, I Scripture reading this morning will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Now I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with the Spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, Yes, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Would you pray with me? Our dear divine Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. 
As we approach our throne of grace, Father, we thank you for this day and for all the many blessings of life that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for this time that we can come and assemble together and take a portion of thy word, Father, and take it in our hearts and to our minds and hopefully be able to strengthen our Christian faith, Father, through your word, but also be able to take the message to a lost and dying world. Father, we see the majesty in all your design as we look across our country, we look across uh, the storm that has just swept through different states, Father, we see the majesty in your power and we're in awe, Father. May we always understand and know that you control what goes on with us here on earth, that we don't have to fear from anything that are outside forces that are described to us, Father, that you are in control of everything. And we're thankful for that. Father, we're thankful for the church that meets here at Southern Hills. We thank you for her eldership. We pray that you would be with these men as they direct us, Father, that, that they would make sound and wise decision. And if they come to a decision that's not in thy way, Father, they'd be defeated in that decision and be shown the truth through your word, Father. We're thankful for the men that serve as deacons here to help out with the work, Father. We pray that you'd be with them, that they would have a zealous attitude in that, that, they, that the work that they perform here, Father. And we thank you for all the Christians that meet here, Father, and gather together as we strengthen one another, and as we look to your word, Father, to help guide our faith, that we will always look to thee for every decision that we make. Father, we know those that were mentioned this morning as being ill. We'd like to place before you, Father, especially uh, Lois Prate. We pray that you'd be with her, that, you, that she would regain her strength. We're thankful that she has been able to return back to her place of abode. We pray that you'd be with the Doug Smithson has spent some time in St. Thomas. Father, we pray that you'd watch over and care for him. And Father, we realize that there are people that have been mentioned, Father, here this morning that have recently lost loved ones. We pray that you'd be with them as well. Tyler McKenna Atkins, we pray that uh, you'd be with their family as they go through the passing of uh, Tyler's grandfather. And the Ezels, Father, on the passing of their son-in-law, Michael, we pray that you'd put your comfort and arms around them and comfort them in the way that only thou can. And Father, may this be a reminder to us that we have the uncertainty of life, but the certainty of death that comes to each of us, and we prepare our minds and our hearts and our souls to meet that end, Father, that when we meet you on Judgment Day, Father, you'll look upon us and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we pray that you would help us to put forth your word into the world, Father. We realize there are many that are lost and dying and sinful, uh, lives. We pray that you'd watch over and care for us as we help to deliver that message. May we do it with salt, Father, that it would be received on good and tender hearts, Father, that we realize and understand that you give the increase. Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you give each of us as we live in this country. We, re we realize that those liberties and those freedoms come with a cost. We pray that you would always help us to be mindful of the great sacrifices that made before us to help us give us those sacrifices that we could have and an, an, an have an enduring legacy, Father, that we could worship Thee in spirit and truth without fear of persecution. And there we realize, Father, that we have it great in this country, and there's other places around the world that don't have it as well as we have it in America. We pray that you would beat these uh, people as they try to worship you, Father, that you would watch over and care for them, that you would give them strength in times of persecution. Help us to always remind ourselves that the reason that we have this great opportunity is because of thy son, Jesus the Christ, Father, that through him, that through his death, we may have life eternally as long as we remain faithful to thee. We pray that you would watch over and care for us, that you would guide, guard, direct us, Father, and help us to always put you first in our lives. Forgive us of our sins, for it is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number five. Number five. We'll sing all three verses. There are things as we try.
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And then she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. This was the first sin. It was this decision of man in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 that would bring sin and its devastating destruction into the world. But our great God had a solution. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's answer to the sin problem of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 was to send his only begotten Son to this earth to die on the cross. And it would be that shed blood on the cross from his Son, Jesus Christ, that would remiss our sins. And there is absolutely nothing that was going to stop that. That's exactly what the Word of God explains. From Genesis 3, 6 on, we see that evil man could not stop that. We see that God's own people would not stop that. We see that the greatest enemy of the cross, the devil himself, would not stop that. God's solution to the sin problem for you and I would happen no matter what got in the way. Why is that? Because of God's immeasurable love for each one of us. Those of us this morning who have accepted that love and have committed our lives to service of Him to bring Him glory, we now have an opportunity to focus on that love and what Jesus Christ did for each one of us, because God solved this sin problem. Would you bow with me as I offer a prayer before we partake of the bread? Our merciful, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now in thankfulness for your love. Without you, we would be absolutely nothing. We fail you when left to our own devices, but you are willing to reconcile us back to you. Thank you for providing your only begotten Son as the perfect sin offering, as the sacrifice that we needed. And now as we focus on his death at this time and partake of the bread, we are reminded of his body that he freely gave on our behalf. We pray these things in thanksgiving and through Jesus. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Our great God, we come to you again in prayer now as we remember the blood that Jesus shed. 
You have given us this fruit of the vine that signifies his blood. This blood is the only means to truly solve the problem of sin. We're so thankful for your love and we're thankful for this time that we have to focus on that blood. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. And now, for those of us that believe in Jesus Christ and have accepted the love of God, we consider this a privilege because we want to give back to the one that has blessed us so much because we want to work alongside him so that his kingdom would flourish and because we want this great God that we know has done so much for us to be glorified. We now have an opportunity to give of our means as our offering back to God. After the prayer, you'll see on the screen ways that you can give, either by taking a picture of the QR code or by texting the phone number or by placing your money in the collection box in the back. Let's bow together. God, our Father in heaven, Again, we are so thankful for everything that you've done for us. Many times we become complacent with what you've given us, forgetful that everything does in fact come from you. We're thankful that you have blessed us so much. We're also thankful that now you have allowed us to work in conjunction with you and your providence, your control that we can give of our money, of our blessings to the church so that your kingdom work can be done. We pray that you would help us to have the right heart to do so cheerfully. And we pray that all the decisions made by the eldership, by others managing this money, that all things would be done to bring you glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to mark our invitation song this morning, it'll be number 337. <clears throat> number 337. And before Brother Garrett brings us our lesson, we'll sing number 415. Number 415. And if you're able to, please stand for this song. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. <clears throat> More about Jesus, what I know.
you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open to Ephesians chapter 6. And that's the passage we're going to be studying, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. I don't know if you remember this. Hopefully, you remember a little bit of it. Last week, we talked about Ephesians chapter 5, uh, specifically verses 22 through 33, which discusses husbands and wives. You know, what you might or might not know is that what Paul is actually doing in this section of Scripture is he's giving a number of different relationships. And, and they're very common, at least some of them, even in the world today, very common relationships that you might find yourself in. And, and what he's doing is, is he's giving instruction about how you are to behave within those relationships. Okay, so last week we talked about husbands and wives. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, parents and children or children and parents. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about what kind of launched Paul into this discussion. We talked about this last week, but I want to just refresh your memory to bring us up to speed. So if you're back in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We'll pause right there. That's going to be really important in, in our discussion today, that the Lord has a will. That is there, there is, there is a desire that the Lord has for you in the way you live your life and the different relationships you find yourself within, okay? It's often different than, than the world's will and, and, and kind of the world's desire for the way you should behave within different relationships. But God has in, in his mind and has shared with us through his word, his desire or his will for the way you should live your life. The way you should be as a husband or as a wife, as a parent or as a child, um, and, and, and even later on in the discussion, as a, if, if you were to find yourself as a slave or a master, right? What does God want for me in this relationship? How should I behave? And, and he's going to discuss that. And, and if, if, if you are looking carefully how you walk, you'll seriously consider the Lord's will in, in all of those relationships. If you're paying careful attention to your life as you're instructed to do in this passage, what you'll do is you'll think, okay, what, what is God's will? What's the Lord's will? Because he'll describe it in using biblical language here. There's a way that is wise and there's a way that is foolish. So many people enter into marriage and live so foolishly. People raise kids foolishly. Uh, people are in their different relationships in a way that God says is foolish, but don't be that. Understand his will and walk carefully. Okay? He'll, he'll go on to say as we get back into the passage, verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine. For that is a bockery, but be filled with the Spirit. So God wants you to be filled with something. It's not wine. But what he wants you to be filled with is his spirit. He wants you to live this deeply spiritual life. Uh, the best husbands and the best wives are spiritual ones. The best parents, the best children are spiritual ones. Like he wants you to live a spiritual life and there's a way that spiritual people live. And that's what he goes on to describe, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts. Like spiritual people are people who address one another with songs. Spiritual people are, are people who sing to the Lord. He goes on in verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so spiritual people... Those who are filled with the Spirit are thankful people. They're people who give thanks. They give thanks always. They don't look at the things they don't have. They don't look at the things that they want. They're not people who feel um, like they deserve. Like, like they're people who just recognize what God has given them. And they're thankful for that. And they express that gratitude. And they live these lives not of, of like want and, and, and lives of I always need, 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 but they're lives of people who just say, man, God has really blessed me. And I'm thankful for that. It's a spiritual person. But then verse 21 is what launched us into our conversation. 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Spiritual people are submissive people. Now, we talked about this last week. The idea of being submissive is, is that of lowering yourself. Common misconception about this is that he then only talks to wives. It's not true. He talks to wives. He talks to husbands. He talks to children. He talks to parents. He talks to slaves. He talks to masters. Who are supposed to be submissive? Well, any one of them that's spiritual. There is no relationship you will ever enter into where God says you should see yourself as being more valuable than the other person. Now, we talk, they, they don't look the same, right? They have different roles within the home. A husband and a wife have a different role within the home. A child and a parent have a different role within the home. A slave and a master have different roles. But, but none of those individuals at any point is supposed to look at their, their other, right? Whether it be a, a parent to a child, a husband to a wife, or a slave master to a slave and say, I'm of more value than them. Every one of them, husbands, wives, parents, children, slaves, masters, are supposed to submit to one another in the sense that they say, I see them of greater value than me. And I lower myself in importance. For, for wives, we talked about last week, it looks like obeying. For husbands, it looks like <laughs> a whole lot like Christ on the cross for the church. So much did Christ value the church and hold the church and, and, and its importance up that he died for it. Okay, well, he moves on now to this other type of relationship. And, and even within this relationship, realize that the same is true. Parents, you are to look at your children and, 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 and hold them as being more important than yourself sacrifice for them, care for them, love them, be for them what they need you to be for them. Children, be the same to your parents. Hold their value and their importance up. Submit yourself. Again, they're not going to have the same role within the home. But, but they will only be following the Lord's will, if, if both parents and children value the other is greater than themselves. Okay, so we talked about husbands and wives last week. This week we move on into chapter 6, verse 1 starts to say, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Remember we talked about in, in that earlier passage in Ephesians chapter 5, understanding what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Well, that children would obey their parents and the Lord. That's right. God says that's when it works the way it should. That, 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 that's what is proper and fitting and correct in the home is that the children obey their parents. Not that parents obey their children, but the children obey their parents and they do so in the Lord. Now, there's a couple of things we need to discuss about this. First of all, it's kind of interesting what he does here in verse one is because he says, obey your parents. Parents, mom and dad, plural, both of them, you are to obey. That's interesting because when we get to verse four and he changes his attention, he then addresses only the fathers. And, and for years, I wondered, why is that? Why is it that he changes? Why is it that he says, okay, children, you have to obey your parents. But when it comes time to instruction, he, he says, okay, dads, I'm talking to you. And, and I'll tell you why I think it is. And I'm pretty confident in this. As he goes throughout this section, he's talking about different relationships that are to be, as we've talked about, submissive. 
But historically speaking, within all of these relationships, there is usually a single person who doesn't feel they have to be. Husbands and wives. Like you just read throughout the Old Testament, and even the great heroes of faith, the great people that we hold in, like they weren't great husbands. Abraham, at one point, in order to save his life, was, a willing, was willing to allow his wife and lied about his relationship with his wife so that she would be taken and treated in, quite frankly, not so kind ways to save himself. He did it twice. Guess what his son Isaac did? Same thing. What about Jacob? Well, Jacob married not just one, but two women. And then he had a couple of slaves on the side, right? You just go throughout the Old Testament, and what you realize is that, like, men haven't always treated women very well. David, not an example. Solomon, certainly not an example. Like, you just read throughout Scripture, and what you realize is that men often don't treat women in a very respectful way. And so when he talks about husbands and wives, he gives, what, three verses on wives, and then, like, verses 22 through 30, husbands, this is how you ought to be. And it's like, okay, you need to recognize your role. And what he's doing is he's taking what culture has come to accept, and he's saying, no, you need to revamp your way of thinking about it. When we talk about parents and children— Once again, dads, I think more so than moms, have a tendency to be kind of harsh, have a tendency to be kind of gruff. I can tell you within my home, many times, like, like the conversation Alicia and I have has to do with the fact that like, I'm probably being a little too harsh. Like, and I need, I need to, like, like, tone things down a little bit, right? Like, like not expect so much from my little children. Like, like it, it's, it's more natural for me, I think, to be harsher. And, and I think what he's saying is, like, hey, dads, you need to hear this now. And, and so he's going to address them, and then he'll get to another relationship. And once again, slaves and masters, historically speaking, like, slave masters haven't treated their slaves well. Like they're harsh and they're mean. And, and, they're, and, and what he's doing is he's talking about these submissive relationships where each person in there has to lower themselves in importance. And typically husbands haven't done that. Typically fathers haven't done that. And typically slave masters haven't done that. And he's saying, okay, in the church of our Lord, we need to revamp the way we treat each other and rethink the way we treat each other. Husbands, fathers, slave masters, calm down. You know, I mean, like, like you too lower yourself. Okay, so he, he talks about children obeying parents. Like the, the child's responsibility is to both mom and dad to obey them. Now, a couple interesting things about this. First of all, like, if mom and dad don't, like, get on the same page about some things, you basically make that an impossible thing to obey. I'm supposed to obey my mom and my dad, but my mom's saying this and my dad's saying that. Right? Like, that, it's going to be kind of hard for that, if not impossible, for that child to follow that. And so that puts a, a, a responsibility, I think, upon parents, upon moms and dads to make sure that we might disagree about, you know, whether they can have a snack after eight o'clock or something. But like when it comes to being in the Lord and like the spiritual teaching, mom and dad need to be on the same page. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about is this word children, because... I think just like within, within our natural reading of the text, when we think of children, we think of little children, right? We think of like, like two, three, four, five-year-old kids. Um, but the word that's used here includes that, 
but it's not specifically just that. And I think as you read the context of this, in mind, he doesn't have two-year-olds in mind. Because he's writing to them. He expects them to be able to read this and understand it and follow it. Um, Go further. My two-year-old children did what I wanted them to do because I made them do it. Right? When, when, when it was time to go to bed, you know, at 8 o'clock, I physically picked them up and I physically laid them in their bed. And if they got out of bed, you know, then I would physically take them back and, you know, we, and like, like I made them do what I wanted them to do with that age. There comes a point in a child's life where their reasoning for doing things isn't as much I'm being forced to do this, but they're making a decision about it. My two-year-old babies had very little decisions to make. I did it for them. I told them no cookie. I put the cookie jar up high, right? I mean, like, 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 you, like I, I made it to where they had to do what I told them to do. But there's going to come a point, and quite frankly, it's already come, like, where, where they're making decisions now about what they're going to do. And I think at that point, this takes a, a, a deeper application. You have to make a decision to obey your parents. And I think if you keep reading, what you'll find is that like this, I don't know that this ever ends, what he's talking about. The the word for child that's being used here has more to do with like someone who was like come from them. Like they're, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still the child of my parents. And, and, and what that tells me also is that the instruction he's giving them is not so much about everything in life. Now, I, I think good reason and sense, and, and you can even find scripture to support that like a six-year-old child ought to listen to his mom and dad when he tells them to turn off the TV, right? But, but I think he's not, he's not talking about that. Paul seems to be more focused in his mind here. He's talking about things that are much more important than just kind of common everyday living type of instruction. Obey your parents in the Lord. You'll notice as we drop down to the father's instruction in verse four, he is to instruct them in the the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Right? It's the teaching of the Lord that he's commanding children right here, obey their teaching. Okay, like, so, so they're, like, when I think about, like, myself, I'm still a child of my mom and dad. And quite frankly, there's a lot of things, like, as you go throughout life, like, there, there comes a point, and we talked about this earlier, there comes a point with children, like, when they're, when they're little babies, like, you don't give much explanation. It's hard to explain things to a two-year-old, right? Let's, like, like it, it, I, I don't explain to them all of my rules. As, there, there's a point where it's just like, hey, just do it because I'm telling you to do it, right? Like, like, it's time for bed, and I don't need to, like, try to explain to where my two-year-old can understand why he's going. Like, you can't explain things to a two-year-old, but, but I think that the greater a child's ability to understand, the greater my instruction has to be. And there comes a point as you go throughout the life of a child, whether whether that be as a a teenager, uh, he moves into his 20s and his 30s, where really the parent's instruction basically becomes only about the things of the Lord. I think about my parents. My parents have no idea what time I went to bed last night. They don't care. Now, my parents have no idea about the food that I ate last night. 
right? And I, I'm just going to tell you, like, I had caffeine late and it messed my sleep. You know? But, like, they didn't have any instruction about that, right? Like, like, they, like, when I was a child, they cared about that. All right, now they don't. They don't instruct me in all these things of life. But I assure you this. If I were to leave the Lord, I'd hear from him. There comes a point when the instruction, and I'll, you'll find the same will be true with my children. All right, now I have instructions for them about life. And, and, and I have a reason and I have a purpose for it all. But, but if, like, man, if they get older and they want to go to bed later, pff, go for it. What I care about and what I am concerned about is their faithfulness to the Lord. And he goes on to say this, and it's rather interesting. He says in verse 2, honor your father and mother. Again, father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. He said, well, what's that about? The truth is, when you read through Exodus chapter 20, you have what we often call the Ten Commandments. All right, there are Ten Commandments, and, and you'll find they're, they're kind of broken down interestingly. The first five are really about like your, your relation to God. Things like, you shall have no other gods before me. Things like, you shall make no graven images, right? And they're just like all about your relation to God. And, and then the second five or the second group of these commands are more about like personal relationships. You shall not murder. Uh, you shall not steal, you know, and things along those lines. Well, with, within this second group of how we treat each other, actually the first of them is, is this command to honor your father and mother. But what's interesting about this command, and he, he brings it up here. He says, it's, it's the first command with a promise. Now, that's interesting because sometimes parents think like, hey, you do it because I say to do it. But, but God actually took it upon himself to explain himself. And actually somewhat to make a covenant with, with, with them. And say, look, if, if, if you will do what I'm telling you, then this is what I promise to you. I mean, very reasonable of our father to act in such a way. Like, like I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this is what you do, and this is what I'll do in return. And, and what God said he would do in return is that, verse 3, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. And so what he was talking about in Exodus is that, the children of Israel were about to go into their promised land. And the question is like, how long would they get to stay there? How long would they remain? And what God says is this, I'll make you this promise. You obey your father and mother. You honor your father and mother. It'll go well. And you'll live long in the land. You'll get to stay in the land. And, and, and the idea behind it is actually, it's very simple and it's sad that, that we, we, it's sad that we don't like follow along with it. And, and, and it's certainly sad they didn't follow along with it. Like the, the idea is pretty simple. God taught the, the parents, when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, what you had was a faithful generation of people. Generations before them weren't faithful, but this generation of Joshua that, that they went into the promise, they were a faithful generation of people. They obeyed the Lord's command. They submitted to the Lord's command. And the idea was that they were going to teach their kids to do the same thing. And so those kids grow up and what they do, well, they just follow in that. And they're faithful to the Lord. And they do what the Lord says. And they submit to him and they follow his command. And they teach their children to do the same. And they guess what happens? Those children grow up and they honor their father and mother. And they do what the Lord says. And, and what would have happened is you just have these generation after generation after generation of faithfulness. And God says that you do that, it's going to go well with you. But they didn't. And they got kicked out of their land. I think what Paul is saying here is like, let, let, let that be an example. Like, let, let, let that be an example to us, Right? That the same applies. Now we have a different land. We have a different promise, a greater one, a more important one. 
like, like what, what should be our hope and, and, and what we cling to and like, like just, just cherish this idea of living long in the land that God has promised to us. And so children, as your parents instruct you in the Lord, obey them. But he goes on then to verse four, fathers. And this is that part I was talking about earlier. It's interesting. So far he said, obey your parents, honor your father and mother. But now he narrows it down to just fathers. And I think the reason, again, is because fathers more so than women, it's not a hundred percent true rule, but fathers more than why, or mothers, have a, a hard time doing what is being talking about here. Being spoken about here. Um, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Like, I can say this because I am one. I think I probably struggle with this more so than, than my wife. I think it's probably typical. Right? That, that I don't know if it's the way our minds are wired or what, that like, like, Oh, we, we, we can be harsh sometimes. Just don't provoke them to anger. And so the question becomes, how do you do that? How can you provoke a child to anger? And the interesting thing is that he actually goes on to explain because he uses the word but, which is like a, con, a, a contrast here, right? So don't do this, but instead of doing that, do this instead. So you would provoke the children to anger by not doing what he says to do here. And that is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction. And again, we often cut right there. So I just got to discipline them, right? I gotta instruct them. Uh, no. The discipline and instruction of the Lord. There is a right way and a wrong way to discipline your children. Some ways we discipline our children just provoke them to anger. Some ways we discipline our children just cause them to rebel. Sometimes we could discipline our children in a way that we're not actually producing any good. They might still do what we tell them to do in our presence, but once they get out of our presence, they just rebel and fight against everything we taught them to do. And he says, don't, don't do that. The discipline of the Lord. And so I look at the Lord and I see the way he disciplines. And what's interesting and, and important to know about the way the Lord disciplines is that the instruction always seems to come first. Matt brought up in his, in his uh, Lord's Supper talk, uh, Adam and Eve. What did God do before he punished them for their sin. He taught them. He put them in the garden. He didn't just expect them to know everything. He put them in the garden. He said, look, of all the trees in the garden, you can freely eat. The tree in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Pretty clear instruction, right? He made it clear. It wasn't overbearing. wasn't harsh. This is the teaching. The punishment came when the teaching didn't work. You flip over a chapter, Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel. Cain does offer something that he should not have offered in a way that he should not have offered it. And, and he gets angry about it. And, and, and what comes first? The Lord comes to him. Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. It's desires for you, but you shall rule over. What's that? That's instruction. When that didn't work, and, and Cain killed his brother, then there was the punishment. All right, but, but what you'll find is consistent with God is that there is instruction that comes before discipline. Sometimes parents can get, like, like they never explain things to their kids. But then their kids act in a way that they find unbecoming. And it's like, they're in trouble. No. The discipline of the Lord 
comes after the instruction of the Lord. But there's also that instruction. What instruction? Of the Lord. Teach them the Lord's instruction. Like, that's what I need to be focused on. Like, more than anything. What I need my kids to follow, what I need them to obey is instruction, not just of things I like or things that I want, but the Lord's instruction. Teach them that. It is that that verse 1 commands them in this passage to obey. Again, I'm not suggesting that a child should not listen to his parents about the other things of life. Other scripture proves that, and and that that is right and good. What he's focusing in on here is that the parent needs to be focused on that child being brought up in the Lord, being instructed in the ways of the Lord, and that child obeying the father's instruction. Now, what you have in both of these relationships is a child who needs to look at his parent and honor them and and obey them and lower themselves to say, look, this, this parent of mine wants what is best for me. They want me to grow and to do well with God and to follow him and to serve him. And they need to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to obey that and lower myself in importance and realize how much they care and love and are concerned for me. And I'm going to submit myself and obey them. Now, what you have as a parent who loves his children cares for his children and her children. And they lower themselves in importance, say, more than anything, more than my own life, what I want is these children to be brought up in the Lord, to love the Lord. There will be, that, that means I might have to like alter my schedule. I might have to change things that I like to do. I might not get to spend as much time in the things I want, but, but I have a responsibility to these children of mine. Do they need my instruction? They need my correction. They need my training and me to bring them up. I need to spend time with them. I need to instruct them. I need to discipline them. But, but all that, that means sacrificing sometimes the things I want to do for them. Submit to one another. That is how you properly, according to God, paying careful attention to the way you walk, understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's his will in the home when it comes to parents and children. If there's anybody in here this morning who's not yet a Christian, we would love to help you become one. If we can study with you, we would love to study with you. If we can pray for you, we would love to pray for you. If we can baptize you, if there's anything we need to do this morning to help you in your relationship with God, we give you this opportunity to sit on one of these front rows while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Have thine affections been nailed to the cross?
Thank you, Gary, for that lesson this morning. We want to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. We do have classes that have been prepared following our closing song and prayer, and we hope that you will be able to join us at 5 o'clock this evening, whether it be in person or virtual. We'll close this morning with number 191. Number 191. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses, and then be led in our closing prayer. <laughs> Be not dismayed, why? bow with me. Our God and Father, we come before your throne this morning. We thank you so very much for all the blessings you rain down on us. Lord, and as we just sang, we know that you will take care of us. You've done so this week through all this weather that we've had here in this area, and you do so on a continuous basis. Lord, many times we take things for granted in life, and we're thankful that you took care of, this, of us this week and we had power and water. Lord, there's so many in this uh, country with the, with the snow that have not had that. And we pray that you continue to keep care of them and allow those things to be restored soon. We thank you for the blessing of this church here at Southern Hills. We thank you for the elders and their, their knowledge and, and foresight to, to be able to lead this congregation. Lord, to be able to, to do your will and bring others to you. We pray you please bless these men and their families and be able to continue to lead them in the way to be able to lead us, Lord. Lord, as Garrett brought us the message this morning, we know that we have the responsibility as fathers in our households to be able to lead our families to you, Lord. And we pray that that is something that we strive to do each and every day and never forget that. As we go into class, we pray that we can continue to learn more and more about you and put those things to use in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.